So welcome everybody to today's session of the Northeast Extension Fruit Consortium Winter Webinar Series. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Mike Bazow and I'm a tree fruit specialist with the Cornell Cooperative Extension's Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. And I'm located in the Champlain Valley of Northern New York. So today's session, we're gonna be covering spotted wing Drosophila and we'll be talking about monitoring, management, and some research updates that are coming out of Cornell. I'd like to quickly introduce our speakers for the day. We've got a, a great mix of people from Cornell today. We are gonna hear from Julie Carroll of New York State IPM. Then we'll hear from Dr. Greg Loeb of Cornell University. And then we'll finish up with Laura McDermott of the Cooperative Extension Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. So with that, I am going to turn things over to our first speaker, Julie Carroll. Thanks for the intro, Mike. Let's get started. I'm going to talk about Drosophila, Spiderman Drosophila monitoring and cherry best management practices. So a little bit about spotted wing Drosophila. Spotted wings spread across New York State in 2012 and devastated primarily the berry industry. And the economic impact at that time we estimated to be about $5 million in New York State. The insect was infesting berries and placing other tender fruit crops like cherries and grapes at risk. The females of this insect can lay eggs directly into ripening fruit and the larvae feed within the fruit, destroying it. So Cornell Cooperative Extension embarked on a coordinated approach to deliver information about SWD risk. And this included our monitoring network. We uh, had this network and we were reporting trap catch on Ag Pest Monitor at the Southern IPM Center. And that generated our distribution map, which is available at fruit.cornell.edu slash spotted wing slash distribution. SWD first reports are posted on the SWD blog, blogs.cornell.edu slash SWD1. This approach alerted growers when and where first and sustained trap catch was occurring so that they would know if insecticides were needed to protect their ripening and ripe fruit. So over the years, the trend shows that SWD first trap catch is occurring about 76 days earlier, as you can see here, from the 25th of July and in 2021, as early as the 11th of July. Interestingly enough, first catch spans about four to 10 weeks every year. And those first catches don't coincide with geographical location like you might think, oh yeah, it's gonna show up in the Southern portions of New York State first, in the Northern portions later. But that didn't happen. And it really indicates that there's asynchronous SWD arrival. In our monitoring network, we were using jar traps with a lure and this jar trap has a drowning solution. You filter the insects out of that drowning solution and it requires microscopy to identify the insects, not a grower friendly trapping system. And yet given the results that we had, this asynchronous SWD arrival, non-geographically uh, correlated, we really do feel that it is best for growers to monitor for SWD at their own farm locations. And given the difficulty of these jar traps, we are now testing these baited red sticky card traps to monitor just for the male SWD, as you can see here, that have these two spots on their wings, one on each wing. So now turning to SWD in New York's cherry crops. Initially, we had estimated maybe a 2% loss in cherries in New York, but as of 2017, that has really changed. This insect has developed an appetite for cherries in New York State. And depending on the time of ripening and harvest, these crops can be at really high risk of being infested. 
So we, if we estimate 80% loss, we're now looking at losses that could exceed $3.5 million of uh, crop value. This is a picture of a sweet cherry infested with SWD, and you can see the pupil cases here from the uh, third instar larva that has partially emerged from the fruit, and it actually pupates right there. Uh, attached still to the cherry, or they'll drop to the ground and pupate there. This is a picture of a third instar larva, and they are very small, about three millimeters long. So you can see they're pretty tough to see. And why are we concerned about this? Because invasive species disrupt IPM. Sprays are often applied every five to seven days. But we now know that IPM monitoring for SWD can inform us when to spray to protect fruit and drastically reduce the number of sprays that might be needed on any crop. This was the tart cherry crop in 2017 up along Lake Ontario. The Lake Ontario cherry industry was devastated. In Lake Ontario's microclimate, we know that cherry harvests are typically later than in inland sites, inland sites, but our research has now shown that spotted wing arrives earlier near the lake than it does in inland sites. And so we look to an IPM approach from Michigan State University to see if we could protect this crop. And I'm happy to give you the results from that. So the Cherry SWD IPM strategy basically involves knowing when SWD arrives on your farm through monitoring with traps and lures, subscribing to the SWD blog, and paying attention to that SWD distribution map. Knowing when fruit are susceptible, taking note of your full bloom dates in your cherry orchards, and using a degree day model that has come out of Michigan State University. Tailoring your spray program in your cherries will definitely help reduce and push SWD towards the end of the season. If you use plum cacurlio and cherry fruit fly and other insect insecticide products that you're targeting in your orchard, that also have activity against SWD. That, that helps eliminate those early populations or not maybe not eliminate them, but reduce them and push them to later in the season. And we definitely know from research in Michigan that the cultural tactics of mowing the orchard row middles and pruning to open the canopy can reduce SWD risk in cherry orchards. And if you're irrigating, prevent any leaks. I'm saying this because a lot of the high density apple orchards today are irrigated. So make sure those apple orchards that are adjacent to your cherry orchards, which have irrigation, don't have any leaks in those irrigation systems. So how do you know when SWD arrives? Well, we've alluded to it with SWD monitoring. This is a jar trap, and this is me in the canopy of a cherry tree checking that jar trap. It's gonna tell you when SWD first arrives. So the MSU IPM system is one SWD caught in a cherry orchard means you've gotta initiate your spray program. But I'm gonna tenor that and tell you that you shouldn't do it if you don't have ripening fruit in that cherry orchard. And then because you know it's there, you can start thinking about tailoring your spray program and reducing unnecessary sprays if you don't have um, ripening and ripe fruit in the orchard. Again, here's the blog link and the map link. And this is the map. And each color in the county will tell what day, what month rather of the year SWD was first found in that county. But what we're starting to look into is whether or not red sticky card traps can be used to monitor your own orchards. And we've been working with that this year and it looks really promising.
These also have to be baited with lures that attract a SWV in. So how do you know when your cherries are susceptible? This is where this degree day model comes in that MSU has been working on. It works predominantly with tart cherries, but they have also looked at the data from sweet cherry and they have found that it works for sweet cherry as well. It uses base four degrees centigrade, Baskerville Eman formula. That's a sine wave formula for calculating degree days. So this basically is telling you what you have to do to run this model. You can do it with NUA and the degree day calculator. So what you first have to do is make note and record your full bloom date in your cherry orchards. Then you go to the degree day calculator page from NUA, click on weather tools and select degree day calculator. It'll take you to this page, the degree day calculator page. First, you're gonna select the weather station nearest you, then the start date, which is that full bloom date. So make sure you make note of that. Then the end date, just use the current date. Whatever the current date is, it'll default to that typically, or enter the current date, and then select the degree day type. What you want is the base four degrees C, B, E. And as soon as you do that, this chart of degree days will show up. It may give you a little sign that it's working with a little blue hashtag symbol that kind of rotates back and forth. And then the table will show up and you can review the base four degrees centigrade accumulations from full bloom date to determine whether your fruit are at low susceptibility, medium susceptibility, or high susceptibility to SWD overposition and thus infestation. And these are the degree day ranges here. On this chart, I'm showing you the graph of degree days that also presents on that web page. It doesn't have these yellow, orange, and red overlays on it, but you can look at the chart and determine where you are because if your cursor is here, it's going to pop up this little pop up and tell you what the accumulated degree days are. <clears throat> This model was developed by Dr. Larry Goot and Dr. Nikki Rothwell at Michigan State University. So if it's low risk, you know that fruit just are too hard for SWD to ovipose it in. If it's high risk, you know that there is risk of fruit infestation. So the other aspect is if you don't catch SWD, there's zero risk. So monitoring is important. And remember, one SWD caught in a cherry orchard means the fruit is at high risk of infestation if it is ripening and ripe. The common name for this insect in Japan is cherry fruit fly, just to give you a sense. Now, I have written this up on the SWD blog. So there's a description of this model on the blog. And I just updated it with the new NUA 3.0 degree day calculator web link yesterday. So how do you tailor your cherry spray program? Well, you can consult the SWD insecticide quick guide that we have on the SWD management page, which is at fruit.cornell.edu spotted wing. And you can scroll down that page and find the management page from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, before SWD arrives or builds up, choose insecticides for plum cacurlio, cherry fruit fly, et cetera, that have activity against SWD. Always rotate your active ingredients, the IRAC groups, for insecticide resistance management. And Trust and Mustang Max resistance are showing up in California in SWD. This insect arrived in California four years earlier than it arrived here in the East. 
always read and follow the pesticide label recommendations, which will have the IRAC groups and will help you with that rotation. After SWD arrives and builds up, don't stretch your spray intervals past seven days, seven days max. If it rains, reapply the insecticide according to the label. Achieve thorough coverage and plan insecticide use so that you have materials saved for later in the season that have lower pre-harvest intervals that you can use as you approach harvest. So here's the cherry quick guide. This is an old version of it that didn't have bathroid on it, but you can see the product lists here. Here, what I've done is I've looked at the guidelines for plum cacurlio, and I've circled those materials that you can see have plum cacurlio in common with SWD. And the same for ragolitis fruit flies, cherry fruit fly, black cherry fruit fly, and European cherry fruit fly you can see even more materials have activity against both ragolitis and, uh, and SWD. They're both flies, they're both in the different order. Take home messages, know when SWD arrives with monitoring. Red sticky cards may be the up and coming technology that you'll be able to use on your farm. Then you can protect your fruit with better timed insecticide sprays. But before protecting that fruit, make sure it's actually susceptible to SWD. Keep tabs on your bloom date and fruit maturity and protect fruit, therefore, with better timed insecticide sprays. Tailor your spray program accordingly. Plan a better spray program and rotate those active ingredients to prevent insecticide resistance. And some cultural practices that really do work against SWD. Mow the row middles, prune to open the canopy. If irrigating, prevent any leaks. Definitely manage weeds within the crop row. And cold storage post-harvest around 33 degrees Fahrenheit is known to kill eggs and larvae. And uh, here's the SWD resources. And I think that's my last slide. So I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Really great hey. presentation. I do know that we, we do have some questions in the chat box and Jeremy is monitoring those for us. So he'll be going through and reading those off for you. Sure, okay. great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so we, we have um, a couple of questions that are somewhat similar. The first one is uh, why earlier detection near bodies of water where warming is later? And, and kind of a related question, um, are SWD overwintering better closer to the lake? So that's why um, they're detected earlier? You know, those are really good questions, and those were questions we were trying to elucidate with our research. Interestingly enough, the last two years, especially this past year, the microclimate effect by the lake was not expressing itself. So bloom dates across the Lake Ontario region at inland and lakeshore sites were all basically about the same, May 2nd and May 3rd. And SWD trap catches also were about the same time period. I haven't actually analyzed those data, but that's next on my to-do list. One of the possibilities, and Greg may be able to speak to this, is that SWD is a tiny, tiny little creature, and it's going to be thriving in microclimates where there's likely rotting vegetation, composts, things like that. And those may exist and express themselves better where moisture is not limiting, for instance, on the lakeshore or near uh, streams, et cetera. That's about the best I can do to answer your question at this time. Thanks, Julie. Uh, I do have a couple more if we have time, Mike. Yep, I think I think we're able to get through most of these. Go for it, Jeremy. Oh, okay, great. Um, so, Julie, another one was: Do you have data that indicates that SWD is present in earlier ripening crops, i.e., strawberries before cherries? I don't have data specifically. Um, I think I probably would point to data from California and Oregon, Washington, where, but it's a totally different climate there. It's more of a Mediterranean climate. Um, here in a temperate climate, um, 
you know, June strawberries typically escape damage. Um, but, you know, I think it really depends year to year on the intensity of the winter weather. So for instance, it's been wicked cold this year, uh, this winter, but there has been a lot of snow cover, which may have insulated things from the cold. But typically after severe winters, SWD arrives later. Um, it could also be attractiveness of the crop itself. There is evidence that the nectar thodes at the base of sweet cherry leaves for instance, are attractive to adult SWD early in the season before fruit has even formed, which may be why we'll catch them in May when there really is like no fruit on the tree at all. So there's still so much we don't know about this insect. That's probably about the best I can do. Others may have data on strawberry that may be able to answer that better for you as we get rolling. Okay, and then one other that has popped up a couple of times is can the degree day um, date calculation be used for blueberries as well? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I don't believe so because it is based on uh, published research specific to cherry ripening. Um, and what I'll do is I will look through my notes and find that citation and I'll put it in the chat box as we roll through the rest of this webinar. Thank you so much and I'll hand it back over to Mike. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Julie, for a great presentation. And we do have a few minutes built into the end of this webinar too for more question and answers. So whatever we didn't get to right now, hopefully we can get to at the end as well. Uh, but with that, for the sake of managing our time here, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker of the day. It's going to be Dr. Greg Globe of Cornell University. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to see so many people here. Let me, oh, gosh, sorry, I have to apologize for sunglasses on. I just went to the eye doctor and they dilated the pupils. And I don't know if you've had that done, but bright lights really are uncomfortable. So I'm wearing my sunglasses, but my vision's not very good. So let me put on my vision glasses. <laughs> I apologize. It's hell getting old, guys. I tell you, uh, which one is it? Where did it go? Ah, that looks right. Yep, good. Looks good, Greg. All right, I apologize. All right, so um, I'm Greg Loeb. I'm an entomologist here at uh, Cornell Agritech. Now, actually, the, the person we originally wanted to and had agreed to give this talk is a postdoc or was a postdoc in my lab, uh, Nick Aflito. Um, yeah, I can show you a picture of Nick. Uh, Nick actually put the talk together. He is a postdoc or was a postdoc in my lab for about the past year and the contents of, the, uh, of this slide presentation are really ar around the work that he did as a postdoc. However, just last week, it was his last day with us at Cornell, he's just started a new position as a kind of senior scientist with Google X. Uh, and what he's gonna be doing is really neat stuff where he's bringing together information technology, and biology, ecology uh, to bear uh, for trying to develop kind of new approaches to pest management. So uh, exciting opportunities for Nick, though, we definitely would miss him here. He did a lot of neat work. But Nick put this uh, presentation together kind of in response to uh, Mike asking, you know, could we talk a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing and others have been doing on trying to manipulate the behavior of spotted wing drosophila as an alternative way to manage it as an alternative to pesticides, for example. So uh, the main part of the talk uh, today is going to be on this idea of behavior modification, behavior manipulation, um, which uh, I'll show you some of the results we've been doing and some other people have been working on. Uh, I, I want to kind of end it, and, and Nick added this in too, is another project uh, that Nick has been working on is kind of building on this use of these uh, sticky cars that Julie just talked about and asking whether we can infer additional information besides presence or absence from them. Can we get some sense of a threshold, you know, how many captures represents what kind of risk? So basically, what's the correlation between the captures of males on these sticky traps and infestation? So I'll kind of give you an update on what we found in 2021 uh, and sort of yeah, we'll go from there. What's something we want to keep working on down the future? Okay, so 
what is this, what do we mean by behavior modifying treatment? Well, the idea here is that spotted we just saw like other um, organisms really, but a lot of other animals has to interact with its environment. And for an adult fruit fly, what it's trying to do, it has a lot of motivations, but one is to find food and one might be to find mates. And another one is to find a place to lay eggs for the females. And sort of how do they find these, these resources that they, they need? They use their senses just like we would. For insects, the number of, uh, of senses that they might use for these, for these needs involves primarily visual and chemical. And for chemical would be gustatory, which involves taste, and also olfaction, which would be you know, airborne odors. So they can use these things to help identify a food source or a place to lay an egg. And the idea is that if we can understand what the, you know, the process is involved in this, can we manipulate it somehow to mess them up, to reduce their ability to find a place to lay an egg or reduce their ability to, um, as a different example, find a mate when we talk about mating disruption. Now, mating disruption is something that if you've you know, work with Lepidoptera uh, problems, you know, that can be quite effective. We don't have that for spotted wing Drosophila, but we are looking at these other aspects of behavior that we might be able to manipulate. Like I said, focused on visual, taste, and smell. The idea is, yes, to be kind of connected and understanding what's going on with the insect. And a lot of attention has been focused on how the, fly, the flies find things. And again, using vision, these big eyes, and they certainly are doing that. They also can taste uh, with their feet typically, and then they can use the antenna to uh, detect odors in the, in the air. And it's probably all these things are involved. For both males and females in terms of finding food, we've discovered over time that they're using uh, fermentation based odors often. Uh, and that's why things like apple cider vinegar, acetic acid, um, uh, yeast products, those kinds are attractive. And that's what we often use in our, uh, our, our, uh, as lures in our traps because this is the kind of signals they're looking for uh, to find food sources. Now, additionally, females are, looking, especially mated females, are looking to lay eggs. And so in this case, they're probably using some additional uh, cues, uh, odor cues in particular, related to ripening and ripe fruit. And so uh, some additional work is ongoing on trying to identify what those odors are. And in fact, I won't have time to talk about this today, but we're engaged in some research, not only looking at fruit odors, but at the microbes on the fruit, both yeast and bacteria. And we're least hypothesizing that it's a combination of fruit odors, microbe odors, and vision that really is helping the females zero in on a place to lay an egg. And if we can really understand that better, we might be able to build a better lure, a more selective lure for spotted wing drosophila, um, and perhaps other ways of manipulating them. So, I want to talk about uh, some strategies that are being looked at as a way to manipulate behavior and uh, reduce populations of spotted wing Drosophila. And one of these is groups of approaches that we refer to as attract and kill. So by understanding what these flies are using to, uh, to find resources they want and manipulating that and bringing them into some area where you can also add a killing agent that can provide some control. I'm going to talk about a couple things. Uh, real briefly, I'll talk about these on the left here, these, um, uh, these spherical balls that are capped with a sugar cap. And these spheres can be used as an attractant and then also delivery of a toxicant. I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a product that was developed in Europe called Combi Protect, which isn't actually an attractant, but it, what it is is a feeding stimulant. And when added to an insecticide could potentially really increase the efficacy of an insecticide so you don't need to use as much of it or as much water to deliver it. And then the third thing I wanna talk about is a, a, another, a different kind of attract and kill product um, that comes in kind of a gum that you spread out in, in the planting that has a kill agent in, incorporated into it, but also has combinations of attractants and feeding stimulants. 
So for these these spheres, these what we refer to as atractocytal spheres, again, the, the idea is based on really from work that was done on apple maggot flies, where they found a red sphere was highly visually attractive to the flies. Then they put a sugar cap on top and the sugar in the sugar was impregnated in insecticide. And so when it got wet through rain or whatever, the sugar would kind of dissolve and start draw, falling down on the, the sphere. And the flies, if they came to the sphere and were attracted to it and landed on it, once their feet sensed sugar, that almost automatically required them to eat and therefore consume uh, the sugar plus the insecticide. And they found this to be fairly successful for apple maggot fly and also work out of Tracy Lesky's lab uh, in USDA and others has shown that it can be effective against spotted wing. So here's some data out of Tracy's lab that was, uh, Kevin Rice actually did this work for a couple different insecticides for some different treatments. So on the, uh, y-axis you have the, the, the number or the a measure of fruit infestation and on the x-axis of these different treatments control versus the sphere and you see just the visual cue reduced uh, the, the infestations for both of these uh, insecticides spinoteram which is delegate or dinoteferon uh, which is I think safari which is it's a neonicotinoid uh, delegate or spinoteram is a uh, spinosin. So you see some effect of just the sphere and the insecticide, but the sphere plus insecticide, especially for the delegate, was quite effective, but both were good. And you know, kept presiding some encouraging results with these spheres. Um, so the, 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 I think that's a, some good news there. The, the not so good news is that up to this point, no commercial company sort of taken this on. So right now, this is not commercially available. Um, and I don't know if or when that's ever going to happen, uh, which is unfortunate, because uh, I think it has some potential. But right now, this, this particular approach is not uh, available. OK. Um, let me talk a little bit about the work with on this product called Combi Protect. So this is a this patented product that, so I don't know exactly what the ingredients are, but it, it has several ingredients that are feeding stimulants for Drosophila zuzukii and presumably some other, other types of flies. Um, what you do, or the way the company envisioned using it is that you mix it with a, an insecticide. There's a couple insecticides that they recommend, such as the spinosins, which um, are most effective when consumed. So you mix this feeding stimulant with it and you spray it out into your planting. The company actually recommends that you can use the, the kind of the recommended strength of insecticides, but at greatly reduced gallonage because you don't need as much water to get the product out there because the flies come to it, or at least they, once they get to it, they stay on it. Uh, so you don't need as much spread or much um, coverage. Uh, that's the idea. That, and we're starting to look at this, this product for potential use in New York berries. On the right is a picture of a, a raspberry planting that we started testing it in, in these cage experiments. Um, this is pr a project that Nick ran last year. Um, we looked at it in raspberries. Some of our colleagues have looked at it in blueberries. So I want to show you some different data with this product. But um, the, the treatments in these cages involved the Combi Protect plus Delegate, which is uh, what one way the company would recommend it, or Combi Protect plus half rate of Delegate, then Delegate by itself or untreated control. In this case, everybody got sprayed the same amount of gallonage uh, uh, or same amount of liquid. Um, I th think down the road, we want to actually test lower, lower amounts of gallonage. Um, in these cages, we released uh, spotted wing sophila from our cages or from our uh, lab colonies, um, let it run for seven days, and then measured fruit infestation. Okay, so here's the, the results from New York, and I'll show you the results for some other states. Um, on the left is control, and all of our other treatments re significantly reduced the amount of uh, infestation. The Combi Protect Plus Delegate was pretty much statistically the same as half rate delegate with combat protect and the delegate by itself. So all three worked, um, but they all had delegate in them. So I think you have to sort of think about that a little bit. Um, but the half rate statistically was the same as the full rate. So you maybe you can buy using less of the active material. 
in New Jersey, they ran this in blueberries, pretty much the same result. Um, the combi protect treatments, half rate or full rate, and the delegate with the, the induce at the full rate, um, all significantly reduced infestation in these cages compared to the control. Oregon, uh, same basic results, um, where all three of these treatments reduced infestation, including the half rate of delegate plus combi protect. And in Maine, in again, in this low, this case, low, low bush uh, blueberry, they basically got the same result. Okay, so I, I, just to kind of sum up on combi protect, this is something that looks pretty interesting. Um, the results I showed you, you now you might ask, well, why use combi protect if basically it worked the same as the delegate by itself? Well, the half rate of delegate suggests maybe you can get away of using less amount of insecticide. But I think the more interesting approach, which we hope to look at this year, is seeing if we can get similar efficacy with less gallonage so that uh, for larger plantings in particular, you could spray you know, five or 10 acres much more quickly and uh, using less, less water. Um, so that might be quite an advantage in, in, in making your pest control more efficient. Okay, let me switch gears to this other uh, product that is an attract and kill product based on attractive odors, some feeding stimulants and a kill agent. In this case, we used um, Delegate again. Um, this is a, a splat product, this waxy material that uh, the company called ISCA has developed. Um, originally they developed this SWD splat to include the insecticide, but um, because of all sorts of labeling issues, they've stepped back and they said, well, maybe we'll provide the, the, the waxy substrate as an adjuvant to add to an insecticide that you would apply already. And it reduces the regulatory hurdles for the company. This kind of product is currently not commercially available, but it's under testing by uh, us and other groups. Um, yeah, let me, let me kind of show you the results. We, we did a similar kind of experiment with these uh, cages and tried to, to look at whether the couple dollops of this waxy material plus delegate could provide as much control as either the combi protect treatments or and we actually had some other treatments in there that I'm not showing. And in our case, as well as some of the others, especially on the East Coast, the ACTRA in, the, in our experiments didn't actually do very well. The trend was in the right direction with a slight reduction. So comparing ACTRA plus delegate against the control, but wasn't statistically different. But you can see where the combi protect with the delegate was significantly lower. Um, in the West Coast, interestingly, and I don't have the data to show it, they had a little bit more success with the ACTRA. So we're still kind of puzzling about uh, what's going on here. And I think we need to look at this in, in, uh, again in more detail and how it's presented and under what conditions to see if this thing has potential for commercial, for commercial use here, uh, at least in, in raspberries or blueberries. Um, one kind of interesting result uh, that we did see in our experiments in these cages, after we kind of harvested the fruit to measure infestations, we stuck these, uh, uh, these red sticky cards that Julie talked about inside the cages just to collect the excess uh, males, or excuse me, excess adults in the cages to clear them out basically. But we went ahead and counted what we caught. And the graph on the left is for females on these sticky cards for our four treatments and then plus a couple others. Uh, that we tested in, in this experiment that I hadn't shown you before. And the more flies you catch suggests that the treatments weren't very successful because they weren't killed by the attract and kill. So of course, control, we got the most adult females captured in the control uh, cages. But then you notice that the Actra, we caught quite a few females in there as well, not statistically different from control. Um, and then for the the combi protect treatments, we saw um, significant fewer flies caught because they were killed by the attract the 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 the, the product. Um, this last one on the right is this uh, gum product that we've been working with, and in our experiment, it actually didn't do very well. And I uh, I can talk more about that if people have questions about that. It's a product out of Oregon State, um, and. Uh, we're still looking into it as a its potential as an attract and kill uh, uh, technology as well. 
on the right is the number of males captured on these cards. And that's kind of what's made us real curious. And I just, you see the circle around the, the Actra plus Delegate. We caught no males in this treatment. Um, so oddly, it seems like the Actra is particularly attractive to males and kind of wiped them out. It didn't really affect infestation or females uh, based on the experiments we did, but it made you wonder whether, well, if we can really, in a larger scale experiment, remove males before they have a chance to mate, maybe this is a, a potential pest management tool, something we want to look at more, more carefully in the future. Okay. So those are the, the, the this is, I kind of described the work we're doing on using attractants in a way to help manipulate behavior to manage spotted wing. We're also doing quite a bit of work with sort of the opposite through an understanding of their chemical ecology, trying to develop repellents that would keep spotted wing or spotted wing females in particular out of a planting so they don't lay eggs. Um, by repellent, I use this definition of a phenomenon that prevents a pest's ability to track, locate, and or recognize its host. And we're probably most familiar with repellents used against mosquitoes. And as this, this cartoon suggests, repellents for mosquitoes are really quite effective. Um, and so the, the saying here is, apart from Mr. Akamora, uh, is there anybody else who didn't put on the insect repellent? Because he's being carried away by these voracious mosquitoes. To date, we haven't really developed a repellent that works like it does with mosquitoes and, and, and some of these other biting insects for agricultural pests like spotted wing drosophila. But it's an area we're actively working on. We've actually discovered a few compounds that have potential, have been starting to test them in the field. Um, but I, um, I don't really have time to go into the details of that today, but I just wanted to let you know this is a, another active area. And then potentially trying to combine a good repellent with something that's a good attract and kill and something referred to as push-pull is also one of the things we're, we're continuing to work on as alternatives or augment, augments to um, use of broad spectrum insecticides. All right, I think I'm getting kind of short on time. I wanna switch gears really quickly to go over some of this work that uh, Nick has done on uh, looking at these dry traps or these red sticky cards in their capture of males and see how well the male captures are correlating with fruit infestation. Can they provide us additional information? So here's just some pictures of the cards. Um, Julie showed you some of these as well. They collect a lot of different insects. Um, in this case, uh, we were using uh, trace A lures uh, uh, as the attractant. Lots of things come into it, but particularly fruit flies. Um, this is an experiment we did with our colleagues in, in, in uh, three other states. So this is work in New York blueberries, Georgia blueberries, North Carolina, Carolina <coughs> excuse me, blackberries and Maine blueberries. Uh, we all had four sites. At each of our, our farm sites, we put out in a transect 10 of these red sticky traps. In this case, we used trace a uh, broad spectrum lures uh, associated with these traps. And then we assessed infestation around those traps within one meter. So we could actually correlate what we were catching in the traps with what we were seeing in, uh, in terms of fruit infestation. And the reason we think this might be useful is that, and we particularly see this in blueberries, we often catch fruit flies in blueberries even before we have ripe fruit. Um, so if you just relied on catching flies to start your spray programs, you may often spray when it's not necessary, no infestation. So can we get a better kind of uh, assessment of risk or uh, an economic threshold using these traps? So as I said, we looked at this at four sites in, in New York. This is one of the sites, probably the better sites. Um, on the left is the individual traps and have two curves here. One curve is in the, the, the dark line is showing the cumulative uh, capture of males. And then the red line is showing infestation. So just kind of give you a feel for what kind of data we're collecting. On the right is kind of a, a point of all that together to look at the correlation between what we're catching in each of these traps and in terms of males and what's the fruit infestation. It's a messy data, we need more of it, but you can see there is a strong positive relationship, no surprise here, in capture of males and infesta infestations. So there's some, some potential use here. If you kind of calculate this out, it, what, what Nick has shown, at least from our New York sites, is that 
when you catch a male, one male in one of these traps, it corresponds to a risk of about one egg in 120 blueberries. So a very low uh, infestation uh, level, so low risk. Um, and as you catch more, you get more of a risk. We need more data to kind of resolve this, to see if we can come up with some sort of threshold, but this is kind of the idea. Um, the data from Georgia was not as clean, very weak correlation between trap catch of males and infestation. And the data from North Carolina also was pretty messy. Again, a pretty weak correlation there. Um, so, so far, New York has been the best. We haven't seen the data from Maine yet, so I'm not sure what this is going to look like there. If we you know, pull our results together for all of our sites um, and look at that relationship between cumulative fruit infestation and male trap catches, we see this large jump up in infestation and infestation risk at above around 80 um, cumulative uh, captures uh, in our traps. So I'm not saying that you, that's, don't, don't, uh, don't think I'm saying, yeah, we can, you can wait till you catch 80 males. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is there is a relationship here. We might be able to fine tune this into a place where maybe we have a threshold like they actually have now for low bush blueberries, where they, they say up to five captures in a trap is when you would kind of reach some sort of economic threshold. We don't have that right now for New York blueberries or any other of our small fruit crops, but this is where the research is heading. We do need more data, but that's kind of what we're, our goals are. All right, let me sum up here. Um, for this part, the, the, the male sputtering strophila catches were most co closely correlated with infestation in our New York high bush blueberries and not as good for these other states. Um, there is a relationship that, that you can boil down to for one male caught in a trap, risk of a infestation is one egg per 120 uh, berries. Um, as I said, the data from the other states wasn't as good. Um, and we want to keep looking at this to see if we can come up with a, a more useful tool for these sticky cards. And I have to agree with Julie that if growers are going to be using monitoring, and I think it's wise to do so, these are going to be much easier to use yeah, for making decisions for growers because you can look for males. I have to say that the male, the cards have not worked as well in some other systems. I saw a note from Dale Isla that in her high tunnel situation with blueberries, they didn't catch a lot. And we've also had similar issues uh, in raspberries. So I think that maybe the, 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 the evidence is still lacking for some of these other crops. I'm more encouraged for blueberries, and I think we're gonna have to wait on some of these other systems uh, to see how helpful this information is. But um, clearly it's something that I think if we had it and we could demonstrate it was useful, growers would use it or, and it would benefit from using it. All right, I wanted to thank the various people that worked on this project from our other states and also the uh, Danielle from uh, the company Trace that actually provided some of our, our traps and lures for the, so, so these experiments. Um, okay, that's kind of it for me. Thanks, Greg, great presentation. Uh, we are a little uh, crunched for time. So if it's all right with you, Greg, if you can stick around for after Laura's talk, uh, we can get all of the questions in the chat box answered then. Is that okay with you? Perfect. Okay, great, thank you. And now we'll introduce our last speaker of the day, Laura McDermott. Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks for asking me to join. I've been really lucky to work with um, a great team of people looking into exclusion netting for a good um, deal of time. For those of you that don't know me, I work with Mike on the Eastern New York um, Cooperative Extension team. I am the berry specialist and work in the Eastern New York, kind of the Route 87 corridor running up and down the side of New York. And um, when Spotted Wing was found in New York State, we actually found it in Columbia County. Uh, that was the first place where we positively identified it, unfortunately. And it seems like a lifetime ago, but we've made great progress, even though at times it feels like we're we're just struggling against this, but I, I have to say that I am so impressed with growers' ability to adapt, to really um, put their shoulder to this problem, and for the most part, do an 
excellent job of controlling it. But so today we're going to talk, I'm going to talk uh, just briefly about exclusion netting and we'll talk about what is exclusion netting um, in case you haven't heard of this before and what are some of the advantages that growers can experience using the netting, what are the challenges and a little uh, kind of rough comparison of costs. I'm going to use bird netting um, to kind of help us uh, kind of get a sense of that and then we'll cover resources. So basically exclusion netting is what we, we categorize this as a level two IPM approach. It's a mechanical or systems-based approach to helping control pests, um, very similar to using uh, mulch uh, as a way to control weeds. It, it, it's kind of that exclusion type situation. And here are three different pictures of three different farms. Um, the center one, I want to draw your attention to this. This was actually an experimental project done with Peter Yench. I think this might be my only picture of raspberries here, but this was a single row um, uh, that we did with, that he actually did the bulk of the work on and I helped him monitor it and take some data, but that was done several years ago and everything else is going to be pretty much focused on blueberries. Um, before I forget to say, I, I have been working with um, growers that have used exclusion netting on more than blueberries. Some people are putting it up on raspberries in a, in a commercial planting. I've got a grower that's using it over elderberries, a small elderberry planting. Um, but predominantly at this point, it is being used uh, in the field over blueberries. We have um, a few people that have used uh, exclusion netting over, you know, to kind of exclude them from high tunnel raspberries and blackberries. So that is something that is becoming used more and more. There are some specific challenges with that um, that we can talk about if we have enough time. But right now uh, we're, we're really kind of focusing on using this as an, in a field setting. So exclusion netting is an 80 gram, it, which means it weighs 80 grams per square meter. Um, the particular uh, product that I've been using uh, or that I've been working with, with Dale Isla and Greg and Chris Callahan on some of these projects is called ExcludeNet. It's manufactured by TechNet Industries, which is a Canadian company. There are rolls that are um, differing sizes, but the 13 foot is usually the one we are, 13 foot wide is usually what people are using. And those are two, um, you can sew two of those sheets, uh, rolls together so that you can have a 26 foot wide piece. There are different weights of netting. There's 50 and 60 and 70 gram netting that exists. Um, some of the setting 70 gram netting is being sold as an exclusion net for uh, SWD. In, in lab and some field work that has been done on the netting, the 50 and 60 gram um, weights did not uh, effectively eliminate spotted wing, both in lab and field work. So 70 gram, I, I'm not sure I've seen work that has definitively said whether or not it can exclude the SWD, but we know that 80 gram exclude net does work. Um, some of the advantages of exclusion netting, obviously, are to exclude insects, but I, I would really be falling down on my job as an extension person if I didn't mention that this will also help growers avoid problems with birds. It'll exclude birds, hail, it can dissipate heavy rain, um, moderate the effects of that, which has become an increasing problem. It can also help um, control strong winds. I, I mean, winds are definitely gonna be something that you're gonna have to engineer around if you are in a particularly windy place, but it is possible. And exclusion netting can help you with mammal, um, mammal control, uh, especially deer and maybe even some two-footed mammals if that is an issue. So this is just a very quick uh, kind of retrospective of some of the things that we've done over the past uh, almost 15 years. Um, we started with a farm, Hayberry Farm, who's in Hoosick Falls, New York. They were working, looking at 80 gram netting just over a row. 
uh, with positive results. Um, then 2014, Dale Isla was able to get some grant funding to look at the 80 gram versus 60 gram uh, versus bird netting. And we have great results for the 80 gram uh, in those, those studies. Um, 2015, some more of the pesticide and bird netting, looking at that 80 gram uh, material. And then we looked at different things with attract and kill spheres, um, the Poughkeepsie Farm Project, which is the 2018 study that Peter Yench did was also looking at attract and kill spheres and, and Greg had shown some of those. And then finally, we are in kind of the latter stages of this research, now focusing on trying to help growers understand how to put that support structure up. Because unlike a lot of other um, products that are coming to netting things, we, there is no kind of guidance for people who have never constructed this type of thing by themselves. So Chris Callahan has been really, really uh, helpful on that. And I'll show you some resources that he's developed um, as we get a little bit further in the um, presentation. So this again is a summary of the work that was done. These are um, data that Greg's lab did the you know, I was really just the boots on the ground for data collection. Uh, Dale Isla kept track of the yields and um, Greg's lab, the Loeb lab, uh, worked out how much what the percent infestation was by some um, fairly intensive fruit collections that we did. But basically, um, throughout the entire time, we were able to keep uh, infestation with no sprays uh, to extremely low levels using this um, exclusion netting. And our, and I do want to point out that the yields in this um, acreage, it's about a half an acre or so, are extremely high. We, re we uh, estimate that New York production is on the lower end for the, for the country. We, we estimate somewhere between six and 10 at the very upper end for our production. And that is not always, um, we're not always sure if that's exactly right, but we're thinking it's probably a little bit lower near the 6,000 pounds per acre. Whereas we are seeing in other states that that um, is much higher. I think that in Oregon, it's probably close to 10,000 pounds per acre. And even uh, less traditional areas of the country are getting slightly higher yields, perhaps because they are managing them more intensively with chemicals and they are a wholesale production so that the chemical usage is not questioned so much by their direct market customers as we are seeing in the Northeast. So let's just keep it. So the biggest advantage, I really think that we can off the ex exclusion netting can offer. Um, there are several, but this, this is the biggest advantage that we can pretty much say that if for, for um, spotted wing drosophila and if you can manage to keep um, some of the other pest problems that we see with blueberries cropping up, if you can keep them out, which that is a little bit easier from a cultural perspective, but spotted wing has been the real um, kind of fly in the, in the jelly, so to speak. But if you can manage that with exclusion netting, we can have no spray blueberries. And that would be really wonderful to be able to offer uh, our customers. So some of the other advantages um, would, it would include preventing hail damage. And the, um, first of all, when you think about what hail does, it, it obviously can cause a lot of problems. And here's a couple of pictures of problems, depending upon the stage um, that the hail comes, the growth stage. But hail also has some long-term consequences in that it can open up tissue on plants and allow some more infection from um, other diseases. So trying to prevent hail damage is, is a huge deal for blueberry producers. Um, excess rain and strong wind. And these pictures, uh, it kind of looks like bird damage, but this is actually damage from uh, excessive rain, the splitting that happened and some heavy, and heavy wind can cause, um, you know, a very large portion of your crop to fall to the ground if it's right at the um, mature stage. So trying to kind of 
mute that almost or, or just lessen the effect of that by using exclusion netting as both a wind barrier and a uh, heavy rain dissipator is helpful. So the biggest, biggest aid, I think, truthfully, can probably come for bird control uh, along with spotted wing control. And so some of the work that's done on, on bird control in New York State uh, research estimates that um, blueberry yield loss is somewhere between 50, a little bit over 50 percent, both at a low management end and a high management end. So that's using all kinds of auditory, visual, lethal, chemical repellents, everything except exclusion netting. And we still ended up getting a fairly, a very significant uh, yield loss because of birds. And this is something that growers seem somewhat resistant to acknowledging. I, I think that unless they see whole flocks of birds, that they're not often looking at the damage in the field as being unmarketable. And so the pictures here show that, that you can't market split fruit or infested fruit or certainly dropped fruit. And I, I was going to say that um, in everything that I've talked to with growers that put blueberry or, or bird netting up over blueberries, they will say that their yield uh, improves by almost 30%. But this research done in 2017 indicates that it could be even more that we're seeing as an advantage from, from netting. So I, I just want to put that out there because I think it's a huge deal in blueberry production. Um, less so in strawberry production and, and raspberry production, but I have seen uh, bird damage in both of those crops as well. Um, and growers acknowledge that once they put the bird netting up is that they really do acknowledge that this is the effective way to control birds. And then there's just some information from other states to uh, give you some an idea of how much loss there is when we allow birds to prey. So some of the challenges of exclusion netting include the initial cost, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a second, and then the labor for that annual setup. And so what we've been trying to do with this project with UVM and uh, Dale Isla is, is really working hard at this, is trying to kind of make this a kit so that you can, a grower, depending upon the um, coordinates of his, his or her patch can kind of order this framework and put it up relatively easily. And it's not this one in particular, but something similar and uh, can then annually just kind of put this uh, netting up lickety split with a minimum amount of labor. So that's the whole goal is to try to reduce that um, labor for annual setup. So is there a possible challenge for pickers? Um, I think that there are, it, the little bit of data that has been um, garnered, actual data, Peter Yench actually did some kind of anecdotal work with uh, pickers in that single row system. And Lori Nickerson at Hayberry Farm also did, you know, if you're not covering a larger expanse, it is very claustrophobic. So single row netting is really probably not going to be very fun for either your labor uh, for us or for you pick customers. So, so I think that that's another reason to try to help people um, get this larger structure set up. And then um, otherwise, honestly, my experience in it, and this again is anecdotal, but I know that some of the you pick customers at the Berry Patch have also said that it's quite enjoyable. And uh, there is a little bit of shading that goes on. So even on a hot day, even though maybe the breeze is dissipated somewhat, it's actually a little cooler inside that, um, that uh, exclusion net. And so possible disease issues, this might be an issue. I know that this particular farm right here, it's Island Blueberries up in Grand Isle, Vermont. They had some uh, fairly unusual foliar uh, problems that their site was a little bit different. It was a little more sheltered. And then uh, on top of that with this netting to try to really reduce the amount of air movement they might've been having on that particular year. So we saw some unusual things there. Uh, actually, I feel like there might be some more possibilities because it seems like just like under a high tunnel, we're getting really great horticultural growth. You know, the, the vigor of the plant seems quite, quite good. So I think the challenges are outweighed by the benefits by a long shot. 
Um, so here's some of the information, and, and these numbers are probably dated. Um, and I, you know, tried to do a little looking around, but honestly, I think that suppliers are being a little cagey with uh, the cost of things still because inflation and trucking and everything is changing so quickly that I just want to show you this, but uh, if you're gonna price something out, you really have to do your homework and try to get uh, this information, um, you know, soon. Uh, don't, don't try to price it out eight months before and then expect it to be the same because I think prices are changing rapidly. But basically the netting plus the sewing charges to kind of sew those panels together, could, this is for an acre is approximately 8,500. 8, uh, considering that the lifespan span could be seven to 12 years or more, will will take an eight year conservatively, and it's about a little over $1,000 per acre. The structure cost is going to range uh, considerably depending upon what you decide to use. Um, could be as much as $1,000 per acre, but could be significantly less. And then... Um, so assume that you've got an $8,000 pound year per acre and at $2.50 a pound minus some loss, uh, you're gonna be making $8,000 an acre. So you actually could um, pretty much pay for this pretty quickly. Um, it basically, it's gonna cost about 14 cents per square foot when bird netting actually can range between six and 32 cents per square foot um, depending on the netting that you purchase. Another consideration is, and this is some work that was done by Diepenbrock um, in California, and, or excuse me, in North Carolina. And these were trying to put together the costs of uh, different spray programs. And so depending upon what you're using, we aren't used really that familiar with some of the intensive export spray programs, but there's um, a couple listed here, and they would range anywhere between um, approximately $450 for all three of those different spray programs um, per acre for the, that uh, seasonal cost. And then some of the reduced risk and the short pre-harvest interval materials that we are using, which are more expensive and perhaps uh, require a little bit um, increased number of uh, sprays could be as much as uh, almost $700 per acre. That's, that's with the labor um, charge. And our labor is increasing all the time. So that's also uh, a factor in some of these estimates. So let's just quickly talk about some of the bird netting. Some of the bird netting can be, um, as, you know, there's, there's a lot of differentiation in bird net and quality of bird netting. And actually traditional bird netting, I think is very difficult. So let's just talk about smart net systems, which are more expensive, certainly much easier for the grower to manage, do require a, a larger net uh, structure, a framework over the planting but um, certainly lower labor involved, but they are expensive, $5,500 per, per acre. And these are just some pictures. These are kind of what we call traditional bird net, which I, I don't know how many of you are using this. I find this to be in a very frustrating material to use, but it, it certainly is effective. It's just that it's uh, not user-friendly. Um, this is a picture of a, a smart net system. The nice thing about this, and this picture shows in the kind of left-hand side, is this, once you get this up, you can actually pull it across these wires, and it's almost like a shower curtain, and it really does a great job uh, con controlling, um, controlling birds. And this is the picture of a couple of years ago uh, at uh, Dale Isla Riggs, um, the berry patch. This is the exclusion netting. And um, just a really nice quality, you can see through it, um, really nice material, easy, easier to work with than both of the bird net, nets. Um, some of the cultural questions, and here are just a couple of pictures of some other disease problems, none of them terribly severe, but just a little, kind of throws up a little question mark in, in your mind about what might happen uh, in these, net structures that we haven't 
had the time really to, to look into. Um, and again, here's some more information about the cost. Um, basically, the, the estimated cost over eight years, the exclusion netting could approximately $1,100 per year, but you're getting um, a bird control benefit worth of approximately 5,500 acres if we go with the SmartNet estimate and you get some of the other advantages. Um, the, the last point under that uh, cost sharing is that cost sharing is something that I know we've been working really hard with and we do have a, a program in New York State. You do have to ask for it, it's under the EQUIP funding. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I think that um, we have really great data here and if we can get a little bit more energy behind it, we might be able to, this might be able to be um, offered at a better uh, percent of cost sharing and uh, more widely available. And then just the chemical insecticides with again, the fact that the risk to the applicator and environment is bigger and that customer acceptance is a real problem when we're talking about even organic insecticides. So that's why exclusion netting is really worth considering. Um, some of the really great um, resources that Chris Callahan has worked on are some videos and they're all listed right here. These are step-by-step -step kind of videos. They're not terribly long, 30 minutes at the most, but they really talk about everything from basic layout to setting the perimeter posts and tightening those cables down to try to help growers understand how to construct these um, systems. And I just wanna thank uh, Dale Isla Riggs. I, I really um, appreciate her tenacity. She has been really the, the force behind this work. And I think that we are really making headway now um, we've, I've had lots and lots of calls about this, so I am hopeful that people will adopt it and feel really comfortable about using it. Um, Chris Callahan has been a great addition to the program, um, very helpful and really uh, creating some great resources. And Greg Loeb, Steve Hessler from the uh, Loeb Lab at Cornell, uh, instrumental. And then we have a number of, and I forgot to mention a few other farms that have supplied pictures, but Island Berries and Back Four Farm, uh, as well as the Poughkeepsie Farm Project. And we have funding from New York Farm Viability, Northeast SARE, Northeast IPM, and New York State Legislature. So thanks very much. I'd be happy to take questions if um, we have time. All right, great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so with that, I can turn things back over to Jeremy and he can walk us through the questions that are in the chat box and all of our speakers that are able to stick around uh, can go about answering them. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, so taking a few steps back, we had a question a little while back about the um, attractive spheres and whether or not those pose any issue as far as being attractive to honeybees. I think that was mainly directed towards Greg or any of our speakers that can address that. Uh, yeah, I, I can address that. That is a uh, was and is a concern with those uh, spheres. Um, for blueberries, where you might let's say put those spheres out after bloom, at least they're not a, a risk for your pollinating birds or excuse me, pollinating insects. Um, but in raspberries, where we actually tested them, that was a concern. So we actually put little uh, mesh cages around it that were uh, enough to screen out the, the pollinators, most of the pollinators anyhow. Um, but that was some assertion. We probably need more evidence of that or more research on what the impact is, but it's potentially a, a, pr a problem. All right, thank you. Then we also had a question um, about the use of boric acid as an insecticide with bait. Any work been done on that that you're aware of? Yeah, there has been. I don't know at what scale. Rich Coles was doing some work with boric acid and had some efficacy. We tried it and it was kind of mixed in lab studies. So I'm just not sure where that's gone since then. But uh, I know Rich had some six. I don't know if Julie or anybody else has seen any of these data. I have not seen any of those data. I'm only familiar with boric acid as, as a, you know, carbon tarant thing. 
I think, you know, Julie's been working hard in the questions. I think between Julie and Laura, they've, they've really answered most of the questions that we have here. Um, Greg's answered some, uh, particularly about uh, adjuvants, and there was a question about oxidate. Um, those have been utilized. There were questions about nematodes and control of SWD related to that. I think those have all been answered. I think we're actually in pretty good shape for the most part, unless anyone has any last minute burning questions that they wanna fire into the chat quickly before our time is up. All right, great, thank you, Jeremy. So sure. we'll go ahead and just give it another minute or so. If you have anything that's, that's still burning that you don't feel was addressed yet, please go ahead and type that in. Um, also be sure, uh, please, if you haven't yet filled out the poll, please be sure to do that if you're seeking credits. And we'll go ahead and give it another minute. Um, I do have a question, and I, I think anyone can answer this. Um, certainly, I see I see we have someone mentioning the cost of labor. Um, certainly a big issue for a lot of these. Um, the, the question I had was for the different traps that, that were mentioned today, um, and maybe I just missed it, how, what is the density for those? How, how many of these do we need to be putting out on like a, a per acre basis? I'm sorry, what was the question again? The density of the red sticky card traps for monitoring, is, is what it, density do those need, those need to be put out at? So that is a great question. Julie, well, I'll see what Julie says too. The companies, they don't really know the answer to that, but they're saying a couple per acre. Um, but you got to believe that the more you put out, the more chance you're going to catch them because we know the attraction around those, those uh, traps is not that large an area. Um, so I, I don't think we really, really have a good answer yet to what the density, the best density is, but I know the company said something to me about a couple per planting, really. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, really? I agree with Greg. I don't know that there's hard and fast data on the red sticky cards. I know research that's been done, I believe in Michigan blueberries possibly somewhere else where they were looking at the plume of the lure yeah. from the you know the sentry lures and correct me if I'm wrong Greg I think that was only something like a 60 foot diameter so not, not even that long okay not even so, more like so you can eight ten feet okay so it's not really attracting flies in from a very large area and, and when I think like a grower, I think, you know what? I'm not gonna monitor 20 sticky traps in my blueberry field. It's just not doable, right? The cost of labor came up in the chat. So what I typically will, will suggest is for the traps to be placed in the shaded moisture edge of the crop. It's because we know SWD likes humidity, they like moisture, they like shade. And so what you're doing is you're, you're, um, you know, you're setting things up for your benefit to find it as early as you possibly can. Um, that's what I usually will recommend. And then based on the research that's been done by so many entomologists, uh, across the nation, we do know that the edge of the crop typically will catch SWD sooner than the interior of the crop. And that edge of the crop, if it's near a wooded edge, again, or any area that's moist, um, I'll typically suggest two traps, just, you know, also because one might, you know, the lures have been decimated by raccoons or I'm really not sure what animals, but um, we have had that happen. And so you don't wanna have your trap get uh, destroyed and then have no data that week. So that's another consideration. I do see someone in the chat box did mention they're using traps with an attractant based on spacing five meters to start and increase the two meters along the outside. So uh, just what someone else is doing. So I don't Mike, see any other questions coming in. We, so we with might that, just, in, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Mike, we might just mention there was a comment there just stressing that uh, the cost of labor was a big part of um, the consideration when managing SWD exclusion netting. And then also a, a good reminder that you know, there's still space required within that netting structure to be able to get in there and control for 
um, other disease organisms or other pests that may get in there. So making sure that you um, consider that when you're building the system and that you have room to get your equipment in there and do the work that you need to do. Can I just say, uh, uh, going along with Jeremy's um, comment about that, it's really important to leave that room. But having said that, most of our bloom sprays are gonna be put on before the net goes up. So I think growers just have to really consider when they anticipate making most of their tractor spraying. But that said, again, we don't know exactly what's going to happen under that net for, you know, if you have a 20 year old situation where you've got netting on it the whole time. So leaving space is always a really good idea. <laughs> well, thank you all again and have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Bye.